Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, I guess we can start. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Struf Batra to you. So he did his PhD at uh, CMU, in uh, 2010, was it? Yeah. Uh, but also worked at Cornell. And after his PhD, um, actually in 2010, he also was at Microsoft Research doing a great internship. And with you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from 2010 on, he was uh, first at TTI Chicago as a research assistant professor. And then in 2012, moved to Blacksburg to Virginia Tech, where he's now a professor. So um, turn it over to you. OK. Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, thank you all for continuing to endure a long day of, uh, of talks. You guys are in for the long haul, the marathon version of talks. Uh, so I'll, 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 this one will be simple, and it'll be, it's not a very mathy talk. Uh, but I haven't really prepared a long talk. It's maybe like 40 minutes or so. I've kept enough time for questions. So if anything's unclear, please feel free to uh, ask, and we'll stop. So uh, the, the main sort of premise of this talk um, I'm teaching undergrads this semester. So my main premise of this talk is to take motivation from undergrads, which is when you're unclear of what the right answer is, which is fairly common when you're an undergrad, uh, you should be making multiple guesses. Uh, and so I was unclear of what my audience distribution was going to be, so I came prepared with multiple talks. Uh, so I'm going to, in the first half, or like, you know, first 30 minutes or 35 minutes, I'm going to talk about this hedging against uncertainty with multiple predictions. And in the last five, 10 minutes, I'll talk about this one project that we're working on that we're calling Cloud CV, which is providing vision algorithms as a service. Um, so let me, let me get started. So to, to motivate uh, some of the problems that we're working on, uh, it, you know, we're, we're all aware computer vision hard, is a hard problem, but it's really an ambiguous problem as well. Uh, and there's ambiguity at multiple levels. And I've shown this example a few times. So if you haven't seen this example before, uh, anyone want to take a guess as to what that is? Portuguese. Portuguese. <laughs> uh, sure. I mean, it could be anything. That's the whole point. Uh, so these are really nicely crafted examples. So that's now that you see the image in the full context, it's it's still low resolution. It's still blurry, but you can somehow tell that you know that looks like a person, that looks like a table, and therefore maybe that's a plate. Um, these, ex these examples were, were constructed extremely well in the sense that there are patches in these multiple uh, in these images that are uh, pixel per pixel identical. It's the exact same patch, and so any feature, any information that you would extract from them would be identical across images. Uh, yet you're supposed to interpret this patch as a plate, this patch as a shoe, uh, that patch as maybe a pedestrian, and that patch as a cell phone based on the context around them. And it's not just, uh, this sort of tells you about the ambiguity that happens in, in vision problems. It's not just vision. Uh, here's, a, here's a phrase that, that we may have heard. Uh, this is a really famous phrase from Groucho Marx. While hunting in Africa, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How an elephant got into my pajamas, I'll never know. Uh, now, let's be computer scientists and destroy the joke by overanalyzing it. Why is the joke funny? The joke's funny because I claim when you first read it, in your head, you solve a natural language processing problem. You solve a parse tree, and you come up with that first parse tree. And it says, OK, in my pajamas is actually a preposition. It modifies the, the verb shooting. Um, or, and, but when you read the second part, you realize, oh, no, no, in my pajamas is actually modifying the noun, the elephant. And that's, that's, it's, those are two completely plausible interpretations of that sentence. And, you, and we sort of switch back and forth between them based on the context that appears uh, outside that sentence. Um, and in some sense, this is all sort of motivated. I really like this, this quote from, uh, from Daphne's uh, book, which is, um, uncertainty in AI essentially arises out of uh, limitations in our ability to observe the world. At any given point of time, any image, any video, any sentence is an extremely thin slice of reality. And you're supposed to make sense of that. Uh, it arises because of our limit limitations in our ability to model it. We don't know. We don't have good models for sentences, for images, for videos, for objects, uh, and possibly even because of innate non-determinism. Um, and in some sense, if we think about what are the problems, why do vision systems or why do learning-based vision systems fail, 
they, we, they fail because of a few particular reasons. Uh, so and usually our model class is just wrong. Uh, here's, here's a picture that I like to use. It's from a couple of years ago. Uh, and I use it to motivate that all of us, if you look at the models that we use, it would assume that Sebastian would walk like, walk like that forever, uh, his limbs never occluding himself. Uh, the model is a tree structured model. It assumes that if someone tells you where the head of a person is and the torso of a person is, the right half becomes conditionally independent of the left, left half. Uh, and that would be fine if all of us walked like that. Uh, but we don't. And, it's the restriction of the model class to make life easier for downstream inference algorithms, but that, that then implies that any predictions that you make from these algorithms are going to be limited. Uh, we have limitations in, the, in computational limitations. We can't actually make optimal inferences from models that are more complicated, uh, and so we end up making approximate inferences there as well. Uh, and I think the most, the biggest problem here is the inherent ambiguity in certain tasks. For we've seen these sort of psychophysics experiments where, for the same stimulus, subjects perceive two perfectly plausible interpretations of the same stimulus. So that dancer can be seen, can be understood as rotating left or rotating right, uh, depending on different people see differently. And you can make it go back and forth if you hide the top half of the body. You can do it. <laughs> People develop a good skill trying to do that. And that picture can be, of a, can be of a young woman looking away from the camera, or it could be an older, looking, older woman looking down. And I suppose you see one based on the age group that you lie in. <laughs> um, and this happens, yes? Is this really a big problem? Isn't it normally the case that there isn't a large scale ambiguity? Yeah, so these are, extreme, these are extreme examples to illustrate my point, but I do think this is a problem anytime you put a user in the loop where for the same input, people will expect two different outputs. Uh, so here's, a, here's an image where two different users might say that, no, I was actually trying to cut out this object, and the other person might say, no, I was trying to cut out all instances of an object. Um, so this does happen that you have cases where there are just multiple plausible answers there. Uh, that may be because people expect different answers, or it may be because this, the input is just noisy or the model is just incorrect. So my, my, I'm, I'm not going to solve all of those problems, and they will continue uh, beyond me. Uh, but my claim here is, is simple, that when faced with these problems, one of the things that you cannot do is you cannot have models that make a single prediction. Uh, that's really not uh, an accurate representation of what that model believes. It's, 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 it's uncertainty mismanagement, essentially. Um, and what you'd like to do is have a better representation of uncertainty and convey that forward as an algorithm. Um, today, we are essentially stuck between two extremes. Algorithms today do one of two things. They can take an image, they can, they can test it against it, and either at one end give you their most likely belief, uh, here's where I think the person is in this image, and here's where I think their body parts are, or at the other end, they can give you marginal probabilities for all the constituent parts of the model. Uh, the, marginal, the, the marginal probabilities here, for example, are indicating here's where the, the strength of the blue here is indicating, here's where I think the head is. The problem with marginal probabilities, if you notice here, there are three perfectly valid placements of where the leg can be. That's why there's a blue here and there's a blue here as well. So even though your model started out knowing that people have two legs and two hands, when you look at the marginal probabilities, you lose all structure, and you, you forget that you, you, you output something that is implausible under the model. So in, in some sense, you have these two extremes where at one end you have no, you have full structure and no uncertainty. You're, output one, you're outputting one answer with zero, with, with zero uncertainty, and at the other end, you're, you're, you're preserving the uncertainty, but you have no structure. And what I'd like to do is, is play around this spectrum and build algorithms that preserve, in some sense, a sense of uncertainty and also maintain structured outputs. So give you something that tells you what the structure of the output is. So uh, here's, here's an example of the kinds of, of algorithms that I'm going to build. Uh, we're going to work with algorithms that take an image and output to you a set of plausible interpretations of what could be going on in the image. Each one, each one of those solutions is a structured output. So, in the first case, if you forced my algorithm to give you one answer, it would say, here's a person, and I don't know about anything else. So that's what black is indicating. And that's partially correct, but incomplete. If you allow my algorithm to make a second guess, it would say, this is a person, and this is a person as well. That's partially correct and partially incorrect. 
because that's not a person. The third answer labels it as a dog, and the fourth one actually gets it right with a horse. And I would argue that such a set is far more useful than a single answer like that or marginal probabilities at each pixel, which wouldn't tell you what the model really believes in, in a structured sense. And later on, uh, in the second half of the talk, I'm going to tell you what to do with such a set. Uh, you can sort of build ranking algorithms that sort of re-rank such lists of, of outputs. Uh, so uh, th as I said, this is not a very mathy talk, but I want to at least lay down my notation so that I can ground the examples that I'm going to give. And it's, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these things, but this is mostly so that we're all at the same plane. So I'm going to work with, as an example, work with conditional random fields. Uh, so there's an image, there's a bunch of variables. Um, it, let's work with it for now as an image labeling problem. Uh, even though that's not what we can be restricted to, we can do this for other things. There are variables y1 through yn, there may be n pixels. Uh, we'd like to build a scoring function that says how good is any particular labeling or any segmentation of this image. Uh, we'll do that with a node potential that tells me, okay, that patch or that pixel likes to be class three because that number is high and it doesn't like any of the other classes. And for, for an edge, I can sort of have a matrix that says how well these two uh, patches, I, I reward you if they take the same label. These are just examples. They don't have to be POTS model. They don't have to be this form. Um, but it's just a good working example to work with. We can have higher order potentials as well. The idea here is that as soon as you define this, you're implicitly working with a Gibbs distribution, with a full distribution over all possible segmentations or labelings of this image. That's, that's implicitly defined as soon as you write down your factors. And what people usually do is work with map inference algorithms that are going to find you the most likely or the highest scoring uh, interpretation of that image or solution under this search space. And you hope that that works out. That's good enough. We're not going to work with a single best uh, algorithm. What we're going to do is we're going to think of this as a search problem. Uh, and the problem is this green box indicates uh, the set of all possible structured outputs. So every dot here is a structured output that says here's a full segmentation. And that may be this person. And this dot here is a segmentation that contains a person and another region is a person. And this entire space is all possible labelings of these pixels. And what I'm going to set up a problem here is a subset selection problem. So I'm going to actually reason about all possible subsets of this exponentially sized set. So to me, each of those dots is an item, and I have to build a subset of an arbitrary size uh, of these items. And they should, I want to convey that this is a difficult problem. Uh, the, or if there are k labels that each pixel can take, then there are n pixels. That original problem, the size of this set was already k to the n. That was exponentially large, and I'm reasoning about every one to keep it in a subset or not. So that's 2 to the k to the n. That's a doubly, quote unquote, doubly exponential space that I'm dealing with. Uh, so this is a difficult problem. Most algorithms just search for a single best solution here, and that's NP-hard as well. So in the most general case, this problem is obviously hopeless. We cannot, we cannot search for efficiently for a subset. Um, interestingly, there, so we've been working on this line of work on trying to find such a subset. It started a couple of years ago, and then we have a NIPS workshop paper and something that's still, uh, still, that we're still working on. Um, and we can actually show that under certain conditions, you can formulate this problem as a submodular, greedy submodular maximization problem, and that allows you to give near optimal greedy algorithms. And by near optimal, I mean that we'll have a greedy algorithm that has a constant factor approximation guarantee of uh, a, a, about 63% of the optimal. Um, and it's actually known that you can't do better than that under certain, certain conditions. So I'll, I'll let that sink in. That's a strong statement to make, and with strong statement come strong qualifications. Why should that be possible? Uh, it's, it's possible under certain conditions. If you, if, you can, if you can find the map or the highest scoring one um, efficiently or provably, exactly or provably approximately, then we can sort of propagate those guarantees forward. But if the one best search is intractable, then this is hopeless as well. So the general case, there are no guarantees, but under certain conditions, we can actually give you strong guarantees. So I won't, I won't walk you through all the math of it, but I'll, I'll give you some intuition of how we can do this. And the way we actually set this up is, uh, is, is essentially a, a packing problem, if you will. So we view uh, every solution and a radius under some diversity function, some distance function uh, around each solution. 
and we think of the size of the union of the ham union of these of these radius balls around the solutions that you have picked and that's a diversity encouraging function because if you end up picking the same thing over and over again or if you pick things that are very close to each other then the size of the union will be small if you pick things that are far apart then the size of the unions will be large so if i pick these four solutions the, they have very little intersection and so the size of the unions is large and what I'm going to search for is this subset problem. So find me a subset that is high scoring plus lambda, which is a trade-off parameter, times the diversity, which is the size of this, this coverage term. So it's a score plus diversity uh, optimization problem. And I, because I, I won't go into all the details, but because I can formulate this as a submodular function or as a submodular maximization problem, the way to do this is with a greedy algorithm. So you find Oh, uh, interestingly, like the score of a set is just some of the scores of things inside it. The way to do this is with a greedy algorithm where at any given point of time, you have chosen some set of solutions and you find the next one which is high scoring and diverse with respect to the things that you have already chosen. So if you've chosen these two, I will reward you for picking this because it's far away from those and this may be a good solution on its own. So find good things that are different from the things that you've already chosen. It's a very natural notion. Um, computationally, you still need certain something else. The, what, what, what is needed here is this space is exponentially large, so I can't even check the improvement that an item will give me. So I can't write a for loop on the space of items. But we can actually show that uh, the score is coming from that CRF, so there were node potentials and edge potentials. Uh, we can actually show that under certain conditions, um, if you squint a little, tilt your head, jump, on, jump a little, read the paper that we've written, you can actually see that this diversity is basically a higher order factor. You, you, you add a factor to your factor graph which is sort of pushing you away from the previous solutions that you've chosen. So it sort of becomes, uh, interestingly, just another map inference call with a perturbed factor. So there's a, there's a new factor uh, that there's, so this is showing you a summation on all previous solutions and it just sort of pushes you away from all previous solutions. So if you've done a lot of work in building up map inference algorithms that other people have, you can just reuse them. There's no need to sort of abandon all algorithms here. And this big, finding m solutions essentially means running map inference m times with adding a new factor into your factor graph. And what does this factor look like? So it depends on what kind of diversity you want. So if you want something like show me new labels, so if your diversity idea is label occurrence, so I've seen a dog in this image, now I will reward you if you use a label which is not dog. So find me something else that I haven't seen before, then that would become a factor which in the literature is called label costs, um, and there has been work on that already. Uh, if you use a diversity which is called label transition, so I've seen a, a dog cat uh, boundary before, or I've seen a dog chair boundary before, find me some other boundary, it'll become a different factor which is called cooperative cuts, which uh, Stephanie worked on and Pushmeet here worked on as well. If you want something that is just hamming diversity, just go away in hamming sense, and you don't care uh, you know, which label you flip, just how many you flip, and that becomes something called cardinality potential that uh, Danny and the audiences worked on. Uh, and if you do a little hack that we, we actually worked on, it, it's not, all the guarantees go away for this algorithm that we worked on. But there, in, in that case, if you're willing to trade off guarantees for performance, you can actually show that you, this is just a node potential perturbation. So you, it doesn't have any guarantees anymore, but you can just, your higher order factor can actually be absorbed into the node potential, so you can use your original map inference algorithm as well. The interesting thing here was what we found, so obviously we're finding these because I knew of the algorithms that I could use for which higher order potentials had been developed, but the interesting thing was that all of those had already been developed. I didn't have to build any new algorithms, I just had to use ex existing stuff, and we could define diversity functions that would be able to use them. So what do these things look like? So um, what do these diverse solutions look like? So here's, here's an experiment that we did on, uh, on binary segmentation or interactive segmentation, um, where you have an image and you have a user in the loop that scribbles on an image and says, this green stuff I'm interested in, that's an object. This blue stuff I'm not interested in, that's background. Uh, please cut out the foreground for me. Um, so this is a fairly standard problem. We set up a binary pairwise conditional random field 
look at the colors of each pixels, encourage smoothness. That's, that's a fairly standard model. Here's the one best or the map solution from that. It's a reasonable solution. In this case, you cut out that object that you're interested in. Here, the contrast for that uh, arm was low, so you missed out part of the arm. If you ask for strictly the second best without any emphasis on diversity, just find me something else that is high scoring. There is not this. You would get this other solution. And there's, there's not much difference. There is difference, though. There's this one dot that flips. Um, and that's perfectly reasonable. This is what you'd expect to happen. You'd like to learn uh, scoring functions that are robust, that have a little slope, and so you're just one pixel down the slope. And here's what you would get if you ask for a diverse second best solution. Um, you would get something, in this case, another instance of the object. So this is far away from this one in Hamming sense. And in this case, a thing long, long structure has been completed here. And I would argue those two are, this and this are much more useful for an interactive setting, where if you show that to a user, they can just pick one of the solutions and not have to interact with the system over and over again, trying to fix the mistakes made by the first one. So yes? You say, how, do you, how did you get the second best map? So in this case, this is just a div and best, so node potential perturbation. So you are adding to, you're, you're adding a cost to the node. If, if it's a scoring function, then you're subtracting away from each node potential a constant number lambda, so you'd get less of a reward for picking the same solution as the first one. So it's, it's just, if you give me exactly the same answer, I will penalize you for that. And so it tries to be, so as many f pixels as it flips away from this solution, it gets a reward, lambda times a reward for that. And you run map again. And does that give you the second best map? Yes. Second best or oh, sorry. Are you, oh, sorry. Are you asking second best or divert? Oh, okay. Sorry. The middle column is an algorithm called mbest map. Uh, you're, you, what you do is you find, uh, this was not the Fromer and Globerson algorithm. This is uh, from Yair Weiss in 03. Uh, what they do is you find, no, no. <laughs> this, is, this is finding min marginals. And that's what pushed me. And then pick the variable with the lowest with marginal, which has a similar min marginal, and just flip it. And that works. Yeah. It is guaranteed to work. It guarantees yeah. exact. Yeah. And that, that's, I think some of those experiments are also in Pushmeet's min marginal paper. And yes? Um, for the third column, how do you set lambda? For the third column? Uh, it's a tunable parameter. So what we do in most of these experiments is you have a data set, and you have a validation data set. So you're sort of picking the lambda that is giving you a set of solutions on validation that, is, that lead to a set of solutions that have high oracle accuracy, which means that the, you produce a set, one of which is really, one of those items in the set is highly accurate. So you would also have to set uh, the size of that set, right? The, yes. yes, so you pick, a size, you pick an M that you want and we'll fit a parameter that works for that M. Okay. So you should think of it as lambda sub M, so okay. for any m equals 10 will find you something that will give you good 10 solutions. And this is not that validation set. This is what I'm using that lambda on a new data set uh, on the test set. Yeah. OK, so, so we, hopefully that, should, that at least tells you that you know, we, can, we can do this. We, we have algorithms that can at least produce diverse, plausible solutions like this. Uh, what, what I, I, we initially worked on this problem, and I was really interested in what next? What comes after that? What do we do with algorithms like these? Um, this is really hard to do, because if you, if you want to build uh, an autonomous driving system, and it has a pedestrian detection algorithm running on it that tells you that there could be 10 pedestrians in this scene, that's not how you can do driving, right? I have to, I have to go over one of them, otherwise I won't be able to drive. So I need to know which one is the right answer. Uh, and in some sense, what do I do with a set of solutions that an algorithm returns? So that's, that's what I'd like, to, I'd like to focus on. So there's a few different things that you can do. And I've roughly sorted them in the order of increasing side information, quote unquote side information. What else do I have access to? Um, I, like the, I like the first option because that involves doing nothing. It just means make it somebody else's problem, pass it downstream, uh, or in a fancy way, call it a user in the loop setting, uh, where you just pass the solutions to a user. Uh, the second one is, is interesting. What you could do is if you have a temporal dimension to your problem, in this case, we did this for pose estimation in videos. 
uh, the idea is that you'd like to you'd like to know where people's head, torso, right arm, left arm uh, is in every frame. Um, and here is, for example, I'm showing you, I'm showing you, I'm flipping through ten plausible pose hypotheses on every frame. It's it's just ten that it's cycling through over and over again. What you notice is in, in a lot of images, uh, this one, this one, this one, the legs are fairly stable. Uh, the model kind of is confident about where the legs are. The arms are kind of flailing, flaying around. The head flays around. Here, sort of the arm, you have no idea because the contrast is low. Here, for example, there's sometimes double counting happening. Both legs are actually being placed on the same leg, but one of the solutions fixes that. Um, and I would argue that these are, this is a useful set of solutions rather than reasoning about all of them. If you had access to video, you could just set up a trellis problem. What you could do is on each frame, you could extract 10 of these, 10 of these, 10 of these, on every frame independently, completely independently. You haven't done any, any temporal reasoning. And then you can just ask for the shortest path on this trellis, which is finding you a set of plausible poses that are close to each other in time. And that leads to this result, where on the left, I'm showing you uh, the highest scoring pose hypothesis in every frame independently. On the right, I'm showing you uh, this something that's keeping track of the top 30 pose hypotheses and then finding a smooth transition. And what you notice is on the left, it jumps around. Sometimes it sticks to a person in the background. Sometimes it gets confused because of clutter. And on the right, it does a much better job of tracking that person because you know, it keeps around a set of things where the person could be and it, there's a smooth path there. That makes sense. OK. Uh, but here's something else that we can do. If you're, so in this case, your additional information was time. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you something that we presented at CVPR earlier this year, uh, which does uh, Bayesian risk minimization, or at least tries to mimic it uh, in, in some sense. Um, and this is when your additional information is coming in the sense of the loss function that you're going to use. So what if you really wanted to solve this problem and all you had access to was one frame? You don't get a video, you don't get time, you just have this image and 10 options and you have to pick one. The reasonable thing to do, or one of the things you can do, is just pick the one with the highest score. But the way these solutions were generated was in a greedy order, so you'd end up picking the highest score, which was be the first one every time, and that's what MAP was doing in the first place. So you'd have to use some other information to pick something that your model doesn't believe in the most, but makes sense. Why would that be the case? Here's, here's uh, my slide on Statistics 101. Uh, this is sort of the, what you're supposed to do. Uh, so in some sense, there is, there is a loss function that at, at hand. Uh, that, that's how you measure quality or accuracy, right? It could be Hamming, it could be Pascal accuracy, it could be intersection of a union, whatever you'd like. That's some task loss that you'd like to work with. Um, and you, you're actually fitting, not that scoring function is actually fitting a distribution, right? You have access to uh, this probability of, of y given x for each image. What you should be doing is something which is writing down an expected loss. So if I make this prediction under that entire distribution, what is the average loss that I will pay over all possible other things that this could be? Um, and the optimal predictor in some sense, the, the min base risk predictor, is one that picks a predictor that minimizes this expected loss. What MAP does is it picks the one with the highest score, which is Bayes optimal under a zero one loss function. So if you have a loss function where as soon as you predict something other than ground truth, you get zero, your loss function is one and only zero when you pick the same thing, that's when you, you should be picking the highest score. Anyway. But in most realistic applications, we don't have a zero one loss function. If you get half the body right, if you get half the segmentation right, you get some rewards. It's not the case that if you're off by a pixel, your rewards go to zero. So why don't we do this? Uh, we could, there are only two problems. That summation is intractable and that minimization is intractable. That summation is over all possible pose hypotheses, all possible segmentations, and that minimization is over all possible pose hypotheses and all possible segmentations. So here's a, here's a first attempt at this. This is, the, this is what you would do if you had access to this. It's the simplest thing that you could do. Restrict the summation to those 10 or 20 different things and restrict the minimization to those 10 or 20 different things. And what this really corresponds to is taking that distribution that you had access to and assuming that it's just composed of a bunch of delta functions at the special solutions that you've chosen. And under this distribution, then obviously I can compute any expectation I want and I can compute any minimization I want. 
It's got to be only one of those 50 things. And implementing this is, is really trivial. It's, it's a few lines of code. All you have to do is if you have access to these four solutions, you just create an M by M matrix where M is the number of solutions. And the entries on those matrices pretend one of them is the ground truth and compute the accuracy or the loss of the other one. Just pretend if this was true, what would you pay if the other one was your prediction? You build a matrix like that, and you build a vector of exponentiated scores. You don't even have to normalize. You don't need the partition function if you just, because all you're interested in the arg max or the arg min. And this matrix vector product is doing this expected loss for you. And you can just pick the one that has the lowest entry in that resulting vector. And you can see, in some sense, that if this matrix on the left was a 0, 1 matrix, if it only had ones on the diagonals, then you would just pick the highest scoring thing because you would just return to you the scores of the underneath things. And that's, that's when you would return back map, but we should not be doing that because that's not the loss function at hand. And this simple thing works. It, it's, it's really simple to implement, but it actually does really well. Uh, so here's on the x-axis the number of guesses that you're making on every image. That's the number of solutions. It goes from 1 to 46. On the y-axis is accuracy. And what I'm showing you here is an oracle accuracy. So for each, Im for each image, if, I, if someone were to magically tell you what's the best solution in the set you've chosen, what, what would be the accuracy you'd achieve? So this is an upper bound. You can't do better than this. What's surprising here is that it's already so good. Like it, there's a lot of potential here. You look at the number at 1, and that's 65%. You look at the number at 40, and that's 85%. So if you look at a model, and somebody reported in the paper that I have a model that gets 65% accuracy, you'd be like, eh, OK, it does, it's doing something. But it's narrowing down its beliefs to, a whole, to just a set of 40 things, and it's really accurate. One of those 40 things is pretty accurate. So this is a much more sensible model than that number 65 would lead you to believe. Right? So there's a lot of potential here. Um, and what if now we do that min base risk thing I talked about? So this is, the, this is the state of the art that picks the highest scoring thing that gets 65. And this is that min base risk thing that I talked about. And literally implementing this, we didn't change the model. We downloaded the model made available by Yang and Ramanan. We looked at their code. In their code, they were producing the highest scoring one. All we have to do is perturb the map, call map again, get 10 solutions, get 40 solutions, find the pairwise accuracies between those solutions, and re-rank them, and pick the highest scoring one. And this already does 7% better, and that's, that's what we believe is the, is the state of the art on the data set. Why do they disagree as one prediction? <laughs> I've been asked that question before. It's a subtle thing. What's happening is that this loss function um, is a corpus loss. It's an average precision of, key, precision of key points. So it actually, you don't return just a solution. You need to return a solution and a score so I can sort it over the data set. And the two things are returning the same solution but different scores for it. And that's why those sorting is different. That's why the number is different. But it's just an artifact of this experiment. How sensitive this is to the normalization, right? Because you get a score. You, it's not probabilities, right? Yeah. And basically, uh, presumably, somebody has to do that mapping between the scoring so and the probability. Is. Otherwise, everything would be right. right. So one interesting thing that we found in our experiments that if you even throw out the score, so, so you, can, you can convert scores to probabilities by doing exponentiated scores by temperature. Yeah. And that's the temperature parameter that you can play with. Yeah. We tried this one thing where you set temperature to infinity, which means throw out the scores. Just pretend all of these 10 things that you found are equally likely. Even that works quite well. No, but then, then, but then the solutions are uh, a function of the lambda parameter of exactly. the best, right? So it there's is. an interaction between <laughs> so those I've two moved sensitivity. <laughs> I've moved sensitivity from two parameters to one parameter. I count that as a gain. <laughs> um, but that one parameter is extremely sensitive. So you need to have a good set of solutions. Um, mm -hmm. And so here's, here's the argument that I always make in this talk. Doing 1D grid search is not hard. It is really easy to do 1D grid search. And you don't need a lot of data to fit one parameter, which may have 10 or 20 or 30 different values. Unless you want to fit, right? <laughs> so you, yeah. You have, to, you have to do it with problems. But if, as machine learning people, we cannot fit one parameter, <laughs> I, I, I'm not giving a talk where I say there are 100 million parameters, and I'm learning that on 20 images. Yeah. I, I think it's, yeah, it's the, the lambda here is probably quite different, right? It's yes. like, and it's probably much tighter. Um, Big, you know, um, like the rate, the effective rate, lambda is kind of like an effective radius yeah. uh, beyond which you want solutions. Yeah. So what I'm thinking is, 
if that lambda is tight, if that radius is tight, you're going to get sort of a particle approximation to the um, to the mode. To the mode. Um, Oh, I see. So lambda has to be large. Yeah. Well, so if, if lambda is large, then you're going to see, see things far away because it's trying to push you with increased strength. If lambda is small, you get things that are small away. Uh, one thing that we find is because we have this implicit M, how many solutions are you going to produce? You have to fix M and then I can tweak a lambda. Because if you need to just produce 10 things that are really diverse, then I'd choose a bigger lambda because it's a greedy algorithm. If you, need, uh, only, if you need 50 things, then I work with a smaller lambda because each greedy step is pushing me away from everything before. And so that's, that changes how strong I need to push because I'm going to end up pushing 49 times before I get to the 50th one. So it's a smaller. It also, it also feels like 10,000 would be worth checking. M equals 10,000. <laughs> <It's, laughs> even 10,000 is small compared I to the. I mean, it's just linear, right? Yeah, it's it's linear in the in in M. We haven't gone to ten thousand. We've usually observed plots like these where things flatten out, um, and that's usually in the few dozens range, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. We haven't gone much higher than that. But the point is, if you do the if if you do what Drew did, basically with the with the temperature thing, and say, okay, forget about the scores. Yeah, then right? you can't go to ten thousand. Increase M to be a big thing, then you're essentially doing uniform sampling over the whole space and getting the mean, the yeah. mean, the, the, the middle of the of the space, right? So yeah. you'll get the constant solution every no. time. Uh, Do you see my point? 10,000 doesn't feel like the whole space, right? That's yeah. still, it feels like is, incredibly it, 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 it will be uniform coverage of the whole, whole space if your lambda is big enough. Presumably, yeah. Yes? Uh, can I ask an awkward machine learning question? So, presumably we, we may be more interested in the mass under a mode than its height. Um, We're working on it. But, you know, well, I guess that was, uh, it seems like perhaps you could estimate it using similar techniques. Like if you set your radius small, then you can, you can see if sure. you're still in the same mode, that kind of thing. I wondered you, you, what your thoughts were. You, we've, we've tried things like that where you can, you can add a clamping factor, which is sort of killing everything. Instead, it's the other way around. So now you restrict everything to be within a hamming ball, and then you sample within that hamming ball, or you produce diverse things within the hamming ball, or whatever. And you can try to estimate the mass under a hamming ball around a solution. Um, it's, it's one of those things where your goal is really not to estimate the mass under this distribution, your, more, your goal is to estimate uh, empirical risk. Uh, it's not empirical risk, but uh, base risk. And that has a loss factor and a probability factor. And we're, we're working on those things. And ultimately, that needs to lead to a better predictor. And yes, so those, those are all, all things that we've thought about. And, and it, it should help. And in certain cases, we've seen improvements, but we're working on that. Yes? Another question maybe. Uh, I, I'm sure you have thought about it. And I'm sure this question has been asked <laughs> a million times. Uh, for the decision problem, I mean, for displaying anything to the user, I, I completely get the diversity, but for the decision problem, shouldn't just be sampling from the distribution be the right baseline? Like just, of course, these are not calibrated. This is uh, Ramanan's detector, right? Yeah. But there are other post-estimation uh, pipelines which do provide calibrated beliefs. So, and, and samples, full posterior samples. So just grab 100 samples from that posterior right? yeah, yeah. and solve the same problem should be, should be the right baseline. Uh, so we definitely compared to sampling in the original diversity paper. I'm wondering if we compared to sampling. So here's what we, we compared to perturb and map, which is approximating uh, IID sampling, right? And it perturb and map 100 solutions do bet, and doing uh, approximate base risk under those perturb and map solutions does beat map. It does, but different best is better than that. Those solutions are better. And I think, if you keep increasing the number of solutions, then maybe sampling will beat out. But if you're only going to restrict it to 10, 20, 30, or a small number, then you'd rather want to spread those around and be diverse. Because you'd like to present alternatives. And if you have a small mode and your sampler is not getting out of the first one, then you're really not seeing another solution. Because ultimately, you're also going to predict one of these samples, right? So something in that set has to be an interesting alternative to the, to the largest mode, if you will. Yes. This is sort of a, 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 a sort of a related question, but not directly uh, sort of relevant to the this talk. But uh, so structured DPPs, right? So what are the, uh, presumably like uh, Ben Tasker when he was looking at the structured DPPs with uh, with the students, like he must have sort of considered the same motivations to uh, to evaluate their effective, uh, effectiveness in in generating the samples. So structured DPPs. 
uh, so he's, he's referring to a probabilistic model that actually directly models the space of subsets. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, structured DPPs are restricted to tree structured models. Um, because anything higher you, you can't do, you, they need a second order message passing and it doesn't work for, for anything that is loopy. Uh, one of the, I think, I think it's interesting, if that could be generalized, that would, that would be very interesting. One of the key benefits of, of this approach, that, and one of the reasons why we use it a lot, is that it reuses existing machinery. And so you, you can get multiple solutions from, without actually developing new inference I'm algorithms. I'm actually thinking about uh, Sebastian's, uh, answering Sebastian's question, okay. saying that, uh, Either you can do uniform sampling, right, or you can you or you can do important sampling, or you can do sampling from a from sure. a DPP. From a DPP, sure. And and it would be nice to see if has anybody sort of compared the different sampling strategies. But, but for this kind of problem, post estimation, right, the model is already tree structured, so you yeah, can do exact true. IID samples from that's the model. Right. Yeah, yeah. So the there's no need to do can... approximations. No, that is true. Okay, uh, so so this, this something simple here uh, helps. It works better than map, and I think one of the reasons it works better than map is we are exploiting information about the loss function. Uh, you're not doing zero one, which is what uh, map would be optimal for. Okay, so here's uh, here's one other thing that you can do. What if you in in one case we said your additional information was time, in another case your additional information was the loss function. What if you really are willing to now design a pipeline system where the second stage is free to extract more information, more features, be a full-fledged machine learning system in its own? Uh, and you can do that. You can you can think of this as a ranking problem. So we did this for the Pascal uh, segmentation data set. Uh, the task is semantic segmentation for each pixel. Label it as one of the 20 Pascal categories, dog, person, cat, in whatever. Um, we can actually produce multiple of these. At training time, you know which one is the most accurate because you have access to ground truth. So you can pick that and you can train something which essentially looks like a ranking function. So you extract features that are functions of the segmentation and of the image. And this time, you don't have to restrict yourself to something simple. You can extract arbitrary boundary constraint, closeness constraints. You can extract higher order potentials. You can, ex you, can do, you can extract deep features on all of this. And that's fine because you just need to evaluate these features on these 10 or 20 things. You don't need to be able to optimize over all possible space of solutions. You multiply that by a parameter, that's your new score. And you'd like to learn this so that the score is higher than everything else. The score of the best thing in the set is higher than everything else. And you can then treat this as a regular uh, structured prediction problem where you're minimizing some regularizer and forcing it greater than a slack. This is fairly standard. Um, and this works well. So what we've done uh, is on the x-axis again is the number of solutions that we're producing on each image. On the y-axis is Pascal accuracy. Um, here is the state of the art roughly two years ago when the challenge stopped. This was roughly the winning entry uh, in 2012. That's, what, that's our starting point. That's what we're producing multiple solutions from. Here is uh, the oracle accuracy again. That is the accuracy of the best thing if someone magically told us. Uh, what's interesting here is that you know, it goes from roughly 45 to roughly 60 with just 10. There's the, the, this time we're not even going as high as 50 or 100. These are just 10 solutions and you could do really well if you could re-rank re them. So, there's a, there's a large potential here. On, on the, this is that base gain thing, base risk thing that I talked about. It doesn't work too terribly well, doesn't hurt you, gets you about 0.9 or 1% better. Um, if you add more features and solve the re-ranking thing that I talked about, you do a little bit better. It's about 3% better than MAP, so you can actually do much better. You're, you're still far away, there's a gap, but you can, you're, you're at least made some progress. Um, earlier this year at CVPR, everybody was doing deep learning, so you gotta throw in deep features in there. Uh, yes, they help, uh, even for this re-ranking problem. Uh, so you can actually do a little bit better there. Um, and we're working on something that uh, we're, is a segnet, is a, is a direct segmentation model, is a, is a deep model that directly outputs a, segmentation, a core segmentation map. And we're using it to re-rank those existing solutions again. So even though we're working on something orthogonal, we're using that to re-rank these existing solutions. So there's no new information uh, used in generating solutions, it's only in re-ranking them. Uh, and that does even well, so we're sort of roughly 50% through in that gap. If, to give you a sense of what these numbers are and how much that gain is, in the two years since we started, here's at next week ECCV, here's the current state of art on this data set. So we're still, we're still better, we're slightly better than that. 
interestingly, we're starting from this point, right? So I'm always excited when I see something better comes out because for me, what that means is all my curves will now start from here because I can always take that model and produce multiple solutions. Um, but even starting from a weaker model, we can do re-ranking and do better than, than the current state of the art. So this, this works. You can throw any new idea, any feature you have, either in the original model, then you have to worry about inference, or in the re-ranker, and then you don't have to worry about inference. So it's quite liberating in that sense. Okay, uh, so here's something else that we're, we're working on, but is quite uh, unfinished so far. Here's, here's an idea that, that, that I really like. When you have an image, you're not just interested in semantic segmentation, you're not just interested in pose estimation, you're interested in all of them. You'd like to take an image and you'd like to understand it. Where are the people? What is the 3D geometry? Uh, what are the objects in this image? What is the scene reconstruction? If you have to build one ginormous graphical model for all of computer vision, there's just no hope. There's no structure there, there's no, like one tree model isn't gonna cut it. But we can treat all of these as different modules and we can produce multiple plausible hypotheses from each one of them. And now it's a much easier tractable reasoning problem because all you're doing is, okay, I have M solutions from this module, M solutions from the, from the 3D estimation, M solutions from the, from the segmentation engine. And I can ask, what are the most consistent tuple in here? This one agrees with this one. There's a 3D structure here, then I see a person on there. There's a, there's a person labeled here, and this agrees with this thing. The mistakes are not going to be correlated, but hopefully the right things are going to be correlated. Yes? Why is this not one big model? Why, Why is, is this, this not one big model? Your, your hypothesis, as you've always pointed out, is a mixture of point mass error. Sure. Like representation in, 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 of distribution. Yes. So, you in that abstraction something. sense where there's an input and there's an output, yes, this is one big model, yeah, but I'm not... stronger than that, right? I mean, if you think about doing belief propagation, you are, you're doing some kind of schedule on some kind of model with now rather than passing point mass messages around, you're passing mixture of point mass messages around. Sure. So do we, is mixture of point mass messages good enough for, for vision? Do we need to go further? Would it make sense to actually write this down as a model? Would it make sense to take some of the things that you're merging and split them and do this kind of thing on smaller sure. subsets or larger subsets? But, but here, here's, here's the way to think about it, right? Each one of these is a research problem on its own. It has its own different kinds of models that people come up with. Anytime something changes, this is extremely modular. I can always incorporate new things, produce multiple solutions, and, do, and it sort of separates out my sort of consistency problem from my reasoning problem. It's like each module and higher order reasoning are sort of somewhat separated out. If I integrate all of that, there's a variable that reasons about a pixel and there's another variable that, that's reason about limbs of people. It's just much harder to do joint reasoning over all of that and, the, and, and make updates to that as, as things improve. It, I agree that semantically, yes, this whole thing is one big model and you can view it as passing messages on this delta function. Okay, uh, and so, so I would argue that this is now just a tuple reasoning problem. It's, a, it's an expanded ranking problem. You're not ranking an individual module, you're ranking over the space of these tuples. Um, and he, here's an interesting example. I'll show you only qualitative example in this case, which is on the Pascal segmentation data set. You have an image and you have a sentence from someone describing that image. Uh, an HP laptop sits on the desk next to a Dell monitor and it suffers from the classical ambiguity. You don't know if the, if the desk is next to the Dell monitor or the HP laptop is next to the Dell monitor. And if you actually get multiple parse trees, you'll see that ambiguity. So, so next it could be modifying desk or, de desk or next could be modifying sits. And that's exposing that ambiguity that you can't tell from the sentence. But if you have, you don't even need multiple here, but you know, that's this example where your semantic segmentation engine knows it's pretty confident in all those solutions that these two monitors are close to each other, not the table. And you can, you can sort of match those and re-rank those by looking at those two modules together. And you didn't have to build a model that reasoned about sentence and images simultaneously in the first stage. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll stop uh, this part of my talk. I, I just have like five minutes after this to show a demo. It doesn't contain uh, any math, but if, to, to summarize this, this part of the part of my talk, I, I, we all know that our models are not accurate. All models are wrong. 
we don't, even if we could write the perfect model for our problem, it would be intractable to reason anything about it. Uh, but some, some beliefs that our models have are useful. And what we'd like to do is be able to extract out those reasonable beliefs and do some interesting uh, second order processing over, over those solutions or beliefs. So, uh, and this is one way of doing it. So uh, let me actually quickly tell you about the other thing uh, in just five or 10 minutes. Um, about this project that we're working on, which we're calling Cloud CV. Uh, the idea is that the, the history of computer vision is really the history of data sets. Uh, every time a new data set comes in, uh, it makes life harder initially. I remember being at grad school uh, when Pascal was released. It was in 06, uh, it was the second year the, the challenge was running. And I remember, uh, I was a master's student, and some of the PhD students ahead of me would look at those images. There is no way object recognition can work on this. This, this is not how data sets are collected. This is just wrong. Uh, but in the years since then, we've made, uh, in, we've, we've made significant gains. We've made object recognition work on natural images like that. It had you know, 22,000 images, 20 object categories. And then ImageNet came along. Scrap 22,000, it's 1.4 million images uh, and 1,000 and object categories at the classification level and 400,000 with uh, 200 object categories. Uh, but in, in some sense, we have this, this, this new data set is also uh, driving the presence of new models. So people are able to report these numbers that you know, my model has 54 million parameters and it's trained on 1.4 million images. And you're, you're seeing crazier and crazier statistics reported in images where, uh, in papers where you know, there's, I trained my model on 2,000 images with 32,000 cores uh, 2,000 machines, 32,000 cores for one week. Or I trained my model with 1.7 billion parameters with 12,000 cores. How many of us can compete with that? I know Microsoft can, but if you're, if you're a poor young academic like me, uh, you, you don't have the kind of resources to be able to, yeah, I'll, I'll get 32,000 cores. I, I just can't do that. Uh, so in, in some sense, we're reaching that point where the size of our data sets is an enabler and an isolator. We're reaching that point where if, if all of us have to keep solving the same problems just to be relevant, just to start working on a problem, it's going to, it's going to be significantly harder for, for people to gain ground. Uh, so you have, to, you have to do basic tasks like build and maintain a cluster. You have to sort of scale vision algorithms and identify sort of where are the parallelism, what is the design primitives that you need to use, and you need to understand sort of distributed computing. So, it's two of those things are not relevant if you want to work on object recognition. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that we have to be experts in distributed computing, computer vision, and own a cluster just to be able to train an object recognition system. But that's reality. That's what at least students today are much much better at than we saw 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. So we're working on this system that we're calling Cloud CV. Uh, it's, it's an ambitious name with a fairly restrictive goal right now. Uh, what we're trying to do is create at least object recognition APIs available on the web, so anybody can upload uh, images which are sent at the back end. Uh, we have some support from uh, Microsoft in the form of their Azure cloud computing offering, uh, and Amazon with web services. And uh, we do some distributed processing built on GraphLab, which is a project that started at CMU, is now at UW, and a startup as well. Um, I can show you, uh, so just statically speaking, we share a lot of data. So on all of the ImageNet uh, data set, about 1.4 million images, uh, we actually extracted sort of 16 industry standard, if you will, features on all of those images, and we share that on our website. And that's just a static download that's it's roughly 400 gigs of data, and it's, we computed it's about 1.5 years of CPU time that others don't have to compute, that uh, people have told me that they're using. Uh, they're fine. It's, it's much more useful uh, if somebody has just done that and made it available. Uh, what we're also doing is uh, building sort of ConvNet things and making them available on the website. So let me show you. Uh, so our website is called um, Cloud CV. Uh, we've Posted a, a web-based demo here. Uh, oops, where did my image go? It's here. So this is a. Oh, that didn't come. It's a picture of a of a 
of a previous mentor of mine. I do internships with really cool people. Uh, that's, that's Rahul, and uh, he, went, he went scuba diving. Um, and what I, can, what I can do is drop that in here. This is sent to, sent to our servers, and it actually reports back. This is the standard ImageNet 1,000-way classification auto-tagging problem, where it's a scuba diver. There's, I don't know where the electric ray is coming from, but there's a tiger shark and a great white shark. It's neither of those. Uh, Rahul doesn't go swimming uh, near uh, sharks that may actually attack humans. That's a reef shark, but it's difficult to tell. Um, you don't have to use this. So one of, one of the things that I realized, that we realized that was a whole bunch of people were computing uh, decaf features for everything, um, even patch matching, if you will. Uh, so what we, we released something called a decaf server. So if you don't have GPUs or if you don't want to install cafe, just download your images in here. Um, you can even uh, put your data set in Dropbox, point us to a folder. So I have an apps folder here. This is only five. We don't, we don't restrict too many on the web. Uh, it just goes to our machines, and we, with the standard ImageNet ConfNet, we extract decaf, and it's available as mat files. Uh, you can, instead of having this on a web, you can actually just save it to your Dropbox folder as well. Uh, you don't have to do everything on the, on the web, so if you're a little savvier, uh, you can do this in Python. So, Here's the, here's the total Python code that you would have to write. There's, we have an API where you can just sort of include uh, Cloud CV as an, as an object. Uh, there's a config file where you just point us to a, there's a JSON config file where you just point us to what you want to run and what folder your images are living in. So for example, that config file in this case, uh, I can't find it, but there's a config file that contains a list of just folders, um, and you just say uh, cloudcv.start, and those things are sent to our servers. This is a RESTful API, which means you don't have to have Python on, you don't have to have your laptop on, you just issue that command, close your laptop, go somewhere else. Those images are downloaded and results are placed in your Dropbox folder. So you can be using resources or cloud computing resources that you don't have to be constantly connected to. Uh, and you can get results back that way. Um, so we're, we're sort of, our, our target audience, I think, here is grad students. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if it's weekend, results are due on Monday, uh, this might be a reasonable resource for you to use. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. We just have two minutes, maybe one or two short questions. Anyone has a question? How much does it cost? How much does it cost? It's to operate, free. but also as a user. Uh, so Microsoft pays for this right now, uh, so it's free. <laughs> uh, so as long as you all continue to pay for this, uh, it will continue to be free. <laughs> so I should ask you, how much does it cost? As long as you don't, as as you don't use Amazon Web Services. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to. Okay, if there are no more questions, then okay. let's thank Drew again. Thank you.